Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in the last lecture of EC3400 Analog Electronics, we looked at an amplifier consisting of two common emitter stages in a row. Here, I'm going to make a slight modification and make the second stage a common collector stage. Now, I'm going to assume that you've already seen that common emitter, common emitter lecture. So I recommend going back and checking that out if you haven't already, because most of the analysis stays the same. We'll just need to make a few tweaks. The first part of the schematic looks the same as in the previous lecture. This is just your standard common emitter amplifier. And the second stage looks almost the same, except instead of taking the output at the collector the way we do with a common emitter amplifier, we will take the output from the emitter the way you do with a common collector amplifier. So the second stage is an emitter follower. This is actually a fairly common configuration because a common emitter amplifier by itself does not really have that spectacular of an output impedance, whereas a common collector amplifier has great output impedance. So the second stage here isn't providing gain, it's just providing better output impedance. Now, if we were to put a capacitor here and maybe put a couple of resistors in here going to our V minus and V plus power supply, okay, those aren't the best strong resistors in the world, but you get the idea then this would be pretty easy to analyze. This scenario would be referred to as capacitive coupling or AC coupling, and we could deal with the biasing of each stage separately. But this particular amplifier uses a direct coupling technique. So the output of the first stage is just jammed right into the input of the next stage without any capacitors in between. So What's happening over here in this first stage plays a role in how this second stage is biased. Now, in the lectures on single transistor amplifiers, over here what I would do is I would write down what the DC circuit was, and then I would write a plus sign, and then I would write down what the AC circuit, the so-called small signal circuit was. But that won't fit on the slide for an amplifier this big. So I'll deal with the DC biasing first, and then we'll talk about AC. All right, so to draw the DC bias circuit, we open up all the capacitors. So this goes away, this goes away, and this goes away, and we're left with this structure here. Now, this is exactly the same DC bias structure as we had with that common emitter, common emitter cascade. So the next few slides are identical. It's not a whole lot more complicated than the one transistor cases we looked at. And as far as the bias equation for Q1 goes, it's exactly the same as all the single transistor cases we looked at. And you can compute the collector current flowing through Q1 using this formula here. Now, if you want to worry about making sure that the transistor Q1 is operating in the active mode, then you need the Thevenin equivalent circuit looking out of the collector here. And that's a bit more complicated because the base current for transistor two actually shows up in that expression. And I'll refer you to the previous lecture for the details about where that comes from. Now for Q2, this again is the same as what we saw in the previous lecture. We wind up with this expression for IC2, but VBB2 the Thevenin equivalent voltage looking out of the base of Q2, that actually has IC1 in it. So this isn't terrible as far as trying to compute things because you can find IC1 without needing IC2. So once you find IC1, you can find IC2. And solving this equation for IC2 after plugging in all of these various quantities, we wind up with an expression that looks like this. So you find IC1, and then you get IC2 from that. So I once again would refer you to the last lecture for the details about where all of that comes from. I don't want to waste your time by repeating it here. Now, once you've computed these collector currents, you can use your alpha and beta relations to get your base and emitter currents, and then compute these small signal parameters for each of the transistors. So we have the raw input and output resistances of the transistors. We have the raw emitter resistances and the raw transconductance gains.
Anyway, here's our original full circuit, and we now want to do a small signal analysis to compute the gains and input and output resistances. So for this analysis, we're going to assume that we can treat these capacitors as shorts. Later on in the class, I'll show you techniques of treating the capacitors more carefully and looking at their effect on the frequency response. So down here at the emitter, I've taken all of the stuff looking out of the emitter and collapsed them down to a single Thevenin equivalent resistance. So for this particular resistor configuration, I wind up with RT1 being RE1 in parallel with R31, and RT2 being RE2 in parallel with RL. Remember this RL represents an external load resistance and is not considered part of the amplifier. Similarly, this RS is meant to model the output impedance of whatever voltage source is driving the amplifier and is not considered part of the amplifier. Now, most textbooks would probably deal with this calculation by computing the input impedance of the second amplifier and the output impedance of the first amplifier, and then combining the results via voltage division. Here, I'm going to use Marshall Leach's technique of computing everything in terms of equivalent circuits instead of actually trying to figure out the voltage at the base. Here, for instance, we'll figure out what the Thevenin equivalent voltage looking out of the base is and do our computations in terms of that. And at this point, I would strongly recommend making sure that you have Marshall's BJT formula sheet on hand that summarizes all the formulas for all of his various equivalent circuits, because I'm just going to use these circuits and not bother to replace the BJT symbols with the equivalent circuit schematics. I'm just going to sort of use them. And once you've done this a little bit, it actually becomes fairly natural. I'll leave a link to the BJT formula sheet in the description below. Okay, so the second stage is a common collector stage. And you might remember that when we analyze common collector stages, we use the Thevenin equivalent circuit looking up into the base. So that circuit is specified in terms of having a Thevenin equivalent voltage that's nothing more than the Thevenin equivalent voltage you see looking out of the base. So that's VTB2. And what we'll do is we'll say, well, we can then get V0 from that using a voltage divider. And we're going to divide that voltage over RTE2 and this Norton equivalent resistance seen looking up into the emitter, RIE2. Now, what's VTB2? Well, if I knew what the short circuit collector current for the Norton equivalent circuit seen looking down into the collector of Q1 is, I could then find the voltage according to Ohm's law by multiplying it by RC1 in parallel with little r IC1. So RC1 is this collector resistor up here that we choose. Little r IC1 is the Norton equivalent resistance seen looking down into the collector. Remember when we're computing a Thevenin equivalent voltage, we essentially cut the wire where we're computing that voltage looking out from. The other thing I want to note here is that we know there's a minus sign here because the arrow shows that we're pulling current out of the node. Okay, well, what is our short circuit current for Q1? Well, that's going to be according to VTB1, the Thevenin equivalent voltage seen looking out of the base, times big GM1, and I'll review the formulas for big GM and little rIC in a future slide here. Now, if we had a voltage source down here, we would also need to subtract VTE1, but we don't, so we don't. All right, so how do we get the Thevenin equivalent voltage looking out of the base? Well, we get that from our source voltage through a voltage divider where we have R1 and R2 in parallel, and that's what we're dividing over. So this computation here, this computation here, and this computation here are the same as in the previous lecture. The only thing we have different here is this voltage divider from our emitter follower stage, aka common collector. Remember to compute big GM and little rIC, we're going to need some Thevenin equivalent resistances. 
So the Thevenin equivalent resistance looking out of the base of Q1, if I zero out this independent source, is just these three resistors in parallel. Now the Thevenin equivalent resistance seen looking out of the base of Q2 is going to be RC1 in parallel with the Norton equivalent resistance seen looking into Q1's collector. Now, depending on which formulas you use, you might want to also have RIE1 and RIE2. So those are the resistances seen looking up into the emitters, and we certainly need RE2 here. I think this form over here using the emitter resistances, RE1 and RE2, I think that's a bit more natural in this context, but you can use this form over here if you want. In any case, RIE1 and RIE2 depend on these Thevenin resistances looking out of the base as well. So, with all of those quantities computed, you can then pick which formula for GM you want to use and which formula for RIC you want to use. I've written them here generically. In practice in this problem, you would want to put ones on everything or you'd want to put twos on everything. And so we have two expressions for GM and two expressions for RIC. So our small signal voltage gain AV is just the result of multiplying all of these factors together. And here I went ahead and took this minus sign and stuck it out in front. So here we have some factors associated with the common emitter stage. And here we have a factor associated with the common collector stage. But it's a little bit more complicated than just having our original common emitter amplifier and our common collector amplifier because there's some weirdness happening in our IE2. So what about the output impedance? So we'll define the output impedance as looking into the junction of RE2 and the emitter of Q2. Notice we're not including RL because that's an external load that is not considered part of the amplifier. So the resistance seen looking into that junction is just our emitter resistor in parallel with our IE2, the Thevenin equivalent resistance seen looking up into the emitter. And what's our IE2? Well, we need RTB2, the Thevenin equivalent resistance seen looking out of the base of Q2 to figure that out. And we've already computed that. That's just RC1 in parallel with RIC1, which is our equivalent resistance seen looking into the collector of Q1. Here's one of the formulas for IC1. You could use one of the other formulas if you want. And the main thing I want to point out here is that RIC1 depends on the Thevenin equivalent scene looking out of the base and the emitter. And the Thevenin equivalent circuit looking out of the emitter, that's just some combination of resistors. And looking out of the base, again, that's this parallel combination of RS, R1, and R2. And a point I want to make is that RS shows up in this formula, which means it shows up in this formula, which means it shows up in this formula, which means it shows up in this formula. So the output impedance of this structure depends on the output impedance of whatever is driving it. This is the sort of issue that I think isn't widely appreciated about BJT amplifiers. Okay, what about the input impedance? That's going to be defined as looking into this junction of R1, R2, and the base of Q1. Notice we are not including RS because that's not considered part of the amplifier. That's modeling the output impedance of the voltage source that's driving it. So the input impedance is just R1 in parallel with R2 in parallel with the Thevenin resistance seen looking into the base. That's RIB1. And RIB1 is just the raw input impedance of Q1 plus our Thevenin equivalent circuit seen looking out of the emitter times this one plus beta factor. So this is great because remember you want a voltage input to have a high input impedance and this R pi by itself might not be very big but if you include some small signal emitter resistance here that gets multiplied by this one plus beta factor so that can help a lot. Notice that the input impedance does not depend on whatever the load resistance is. The thing to note here is that not only does it not depend on the load resistance, it doesn't depend on any of this stuff happening out here on the outside of the collector.
In terms of special cases, if R S is zero, this goes away and this whole term goes to one. And then suppose for a second that R T E two and R I E two have such a relationship that this term here is approximately one. If that's the case, then the gain of the amplifier is pretty much determined by this common emitter structure here. Also, if RS is equal to zero, then RTB1 is equal to zero, and that means RIE2. That's just RE2. So basically, we have our emitter resistance in parallel with the intrinsic emitter resistance of Q2. And if this is pretty small, we have a very low output impedance, which is what we want for a voltage source. So our common emitter common collector cascade wasn't that much different than our common emitter common emitter cascade. In the next lecture, what I'm going to do is I'm basically just going to reverse the order here. So we'll do common collector followed by common emitter, and we'll see that this actually makes things a lot more complicated, both in terms of the biasing and in terms of figuring out what the input impedance is.